Hello, church. Great to be with you again as we continue our study in the book of Daniel, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, and then moving on to the book of Revelation. Now, last week we finished up the book of Daniel, and now we are moving to the New Testament, uh, to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, this is all going to help prepare us for the book of Revelation. So these are good studies for us. And boy, we're going to learn a lot of depth here, and this will help us to uh, uh, kind of get a feel for how to understand the book of Revelation. All right, so let's get started today. Now, I've entitled this, The Abomination That Causes Desolation. These are some words that were found in the book of Daniel and in Matthew, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. So let's go back to last week. Let's just do a little review here. We were over in Daniel chapter 9. We were looking at this prophecy of the 77s. Now, there was a lot inside of that prophecy. But we get towards the end of the prophecy that uh, this, the, this vision that Daniel is having. Uh, this is what it says. It says, The people of the ruler will come and will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? So this has got to be pointing to Jerusalem because that's where the sanctuary is at, the temple where God is seen as being in the Holy of Holies. And then it says the end will come like a flood and war will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. So again, this is not the end of time. This is the end of Jerusalem or that Jewish age. Uh, it's coming to an end and this is where this vision is pointing to. Now, verse 27 says, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. I believe this is Jesus. Uh, and just um, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, he will bring a covenant. And then in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings. That's the cross. And then on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. And again, I think this is pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem. And here's why. Because Matthew is going to help us out here. So here is Daniel in about 539 BC offering up this prayer. And God answers his prayer with the, with the prophet or the angel Gabriel. And the end of this vision is pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay. Now, we're going to jump over to the Gospel of Matthew and watch what Jesus says about that. He helps us out here and says in verse 15 of Matthew 24, So when you see standing in the holy place, again, this has got to be the temple, right? The abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. So here you have Matthew pointing back to something that Daniel said in the book of Daniel. So, this is found in, Jesus comes in uh, 29 AD, and Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 is going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to point back to Daniel, and he's also going to point forward to the destruction of Jerusalem, because he's going to foretell the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So you can see that we don't have to guess at this. This is all laid out by God. Um, this is this is this is pretty clear. This is pretty clear. So we're looking at this destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and this is going to be the second destruction. Because we've already seen the first destruction back in the book of Daniel. When Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken into slavery. And years after they were taken, the Babylonians came in and finally finished off Jerusalem in 5, let's see, that would have been 586 B.C. And just Jerusalem was destroyed. And in, in uh, Daniel's vision that he gets from uh, from the angel, 
uh, that temple is going to be restored again, just like God promised. But then it's going to be destroyed a second time. And this is what it's pointing at. Now, to help us with that, I want to set the scene for when Jesus comes. Okay? And he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And that's going to bring us to the Passover week. Now, this is going to be, this is the best math that I can come up with. It's about 29 A.D. To make everything fit, I've studied this over years. It's about the best date I can I can get for Jesus's crucifixion. So here comes Jesus, and he's coming to this Passover week. Now, here's an interesting thought. When we go to the Gospel, we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's these stories of Jesus, right? And we look at this last week, this Passover week. That Jesus is going to come into town, he's going to be crucified, and he's going to be raised. Do you realize that Matthew, the book of Matthew, that last week takes up 28% of the book of Matthew? Mark's writing devotes 38% of the book of Mark to that last week. Luke dedicates 20% of his book on Jesus to that last week. And when we get to the book of John, almost half of the book is dedicated to the last week of Jesus when he was on this earth. My point is this. God's making a point. You need to look at this week. You need to look at what was going on during this week. And so I'm going to try to fill that in so we can get a good picture to bring us to these three chapters that Jesus is going to foretell the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? So here we go. So I believe this is going to be on Saturday. This is the Passover week. Okay. Now, again, remember what the Passover is. This is when we're going to go all the way back to the book of Exodus, right? We're going to go back to Moses. Moses was on uh, Mount Sinai. He was sent by God uh, or talked to by God on Mount Sinai, the burning bush. And God says, look, I want you to go back to Egypt. Why don't you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So he sends them. And when he gets there, he's going to bring ten plagues down on Egypt. And finally, when the last plague happens, the firstborn of every Egyptian household dies. The Egyptians say, get out. And they let them go. And they go into the wilderness and eventually get up into the promised land. This was called the Passover, where they put the blood of the lamb over the door. As long as you stay in that house, you will be delivered, and the death angel will pass over, and everybody in that house will be fine. For everybody else that didn't do that, they were going to die. And they did die. The firstborn of every household died in all of those homes. So, the Israelites were told to keep that Passover every year after that. That brings us to Jesus. He's a Jewish person. He's going to keep that Passover, and he's going to come into town during this Passover feast. Okay? So here we are. And it's Saturday. Now, before he actually makes it to Jerusalem, he stops over somewhere with his apostles. Remember? Because they're traveling together. And it says in John chapter 12, it says six days before the Passover. Okay? So he's putting a timeline here. Jesus arrived at where? Bethany. Okay. Now, Bethany is just outside of Jerusalem. It's about uh, almost two miles away, maybe a little less than that. And this is where Lazarus lived. Oh. Again, if you go back to the book of John, about seven weeks prior to this, uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave. Okay. So this is where he lives. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Now, when we put all the gospel accounts together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see this this meal was actually happening at Simon the leper's house. Well, you don't go into a leper's house. So apparently, the theory is is that Jesus healed um, 
Simon the leper. Simon the leper is so happy. He wants to have a feast for him. And also Lazarus is in that town. So Lazarus gets over there. Mary and Martha, uh, both the sisters of Lazarus, and they put on this big feast for Jesus. And so Jesus arrives basically on either Friday night, and they have this on Saturday. Okay? All right? So you can see here, you can see Jerusalem. You can see the temple courts there. You've got that blue river there. That's the Kinron Valley. And then over on the other hill, on the other side, is the Garden of Gethsemane, Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus is going to be betrayed. And just down the road would be Bethpage. And then just before that is Bethany. So this is where they're at. Okay? This is probably Saturday when they're in Bethany. All right. Now it's Sunday. And again, this is the Passover week. Chapter 12, verse 12 says, The next day, okay, this will be the next day, so probably Sunday, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. These people are ecstatic. Jesus is here. Man, we just got word he raised Lazarus from the grave. He teaches better than anybody. We are, he, he's healed other people. He's fed people. He is here. We are happy. So, what happens? Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. Now, where does he get this donkey? He goes to the next town on his way to Jerusalem when he put the gospel accounts together. And this is the town of Beth Page. And his apostles get this donkey. And it says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. This was a prophecy in the Old Testament. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. colt or the fold of a donkey. Okay, so this is a young donkey. Okay? All right? So don't, 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 be, don't be afraid. All right. Now. Here comes Jesus, riding in on this donkey. And here he goes. He's coming down, and he's moved from Beth Bethany to Bethpage, where they got the donkey. And now they are riding down. Now, all this is uphill as you're going up. You're going up from Bethany, and you're going a little bit higher to Bethpage. But then you start coming down when you get to this Kindron Valley. And so Jesus is probably coming down this hill and coming into Jerusalem. Okay? And this is the triumphant entry. So just imagine the people. They are ecstatic. They're putting palm branches down. They're putting uh, their cloaks, their outer cloaks down. And they are just excited to see Jesus. And they should be. But then... We continue the story. Now remember, what we're doing is we're taking the we're taking the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're putting them together chronologically. It's not always easy to do. Sometimes it's, there's some difficulties there, but I'm going to do the best I can. So as he approached Jerusalem, here's Jesus riding on this donkey, and saw the city. He does what? He weeps over it. So these people are ecstatic to see Jesus. And Jesus is like, I'm not happy. I'm actually sad. And he is crying over this city. Now remember, what are we doing? We're setting the scene here. We're setting the scene for the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which is in about 40 to 41 years from this time. And he said, even you... If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now, you know what? It's hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. Who's he talking to? Jerusalem. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. 
They will not leave what one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's pretty sad. So can you see the difference here? The Israelites, these Jewish people, are excited to see Jesus. And Jesus, at the same time, is he's crying over the city. Hmm. Two different pages here, aren't we? Yes, definitely two different. So there's Jesus, and he weeps over the city because they don't get who Jesus is. All right? So then, watch what happens when we put these the Gospels together chronologically. Chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. So he actually goes into the temple. He looks around at everything. He just kind of observes. He's watching. He's watching the people. He's watching the leaders. He's watching all the things that are going on. People preparing for this Passover week. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So here's what happens. He goes back to Bethany. And what we're going to find is, is that Jesus is going to go back and forth all week here. Okay? He's going to do this on Sunday. This is Sunday night, probably. Uh, the next day is going to be Monday. He's going to leave Bethany. He's going to go back into Jerusalem. He's going to teach. He's going to go back. Um, he's going to go back and forth every day, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and there's some debate on did he actually go back on Wednesday or not. Maybe he didn't. I'm going to leave that for you to figure out. And then Thursday is the Passover meal. And then on Friday, Jesus dies. All right. So that's what's going on during this week. Now, I believe it is Monday. The next day, right? Because he went back to Bethany that night. The next day as they were leaving Bethany. So now they're leaving Bethany again. They're going back to Jerusalem. They're going to make that trek. Okay. Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. Because it was not the season for the figs. For figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Okay. So here's this tree. It looks like it should be producing something, but it is not. It has the, the look of being alive, but really nothing is coming from it. Okay. Just find that to be an interesting story. So there's Jesus with his apostles. Can't find any, any fruit on it, so he curses the tree. Now, we're going to go back over here to Luke chapter 19. Then he entered the temple area and began driving those who were out, those who were selling. So what's going on here? They're selling. Buying and selling. So let me try to give you the story here. What happens is that the, the high priest, and they were they were in on this, the, the Pharisees, they were making money off of the people. See, when you when you, when you, when you come to the Passover feast every year, you would probably save up for a long time, saying, Hey, we're gonna go and we're gonna leave our towns and we're gonna go to Jerusalem for this Passover feast. It's going to last a week or so. And the town will just swell with people. Okay? So you save up your money. And you also, you're going to bring your own sacrifice. You're going to bring your own lamb. Because that's what they were supposed to do, is bring a lamb for the sacrifice. So they would bring it in. And the people would stop and say, wait, 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 wait. These money changers. Uh, that sacrifice isn't good. enough. It's spotted. It's got a blemish or whatever. And we got one we could sell you for a lot more. And they would make money off of this. And then there would be the money. And then there would be the temple tax. And there's all this hypocrisy going on. We see it in our world today in religion. So many people are turned off by religion because of the hypocrisy. 
But all this is predicted. All this is in the Bible. This is what people do. Okay? Well, they were no different. And so he he enters it. He see he he begins driving those out who were selling tips over these tables. And this fulfills a prophecy. It is written. He said to them, "My house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a house of robbers." That's what they did. So again, Jesus cries over the city. He curses this tree. And then when he gets back into town after he has observed it the night before, he sees all their hypocrisy and turns over these temples. There were these tables of these money changers and drives them out. That's major. Okay? Now watch what happens in verse 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple. See? He's going to go back and forth, back and forth. But the chief priest, the teachers of the law, these are the guys that are making this money. And the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Hey, you're cutting in on our funds. You're making us look bad in front of people. But yet it says, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. So they are plotting to kill Jesus. They want to take him out. Can you see why Jesus cries over the city? Yeah, yeah. They're a mess. So there's Jesus turning over the tables. Now it's Tuesday, continuing this Passover week. And it says in Mark chapter 11, verse 20, In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. So they come back the next day and they see this tree that Jesus cursed is withered right to its roots. This gets their apostles' attention. That thing was fully alive yesterday. Now it's dead. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. So there it is. It's dead. It's amazing to them. Wow. Now, could this be a picture of Jerusalem? We're not told here. But could this be a picture of Jerusalem, that you, Jerusalem, has the appearance of being alive, but really you're dead. Nothing good is coming from you, and nothing good will ever come from you again. I, I just think that's a picture of Jerusalem. But you wrestle with that. You see what you think on that, okay? But I do find this to be an interesting story. Could that be a picture? Of what Jerusalem looks like. Just a thought. Now it is Tuesday or Wednesday. It still could be Tuesday. While Jesus is now teaching in the temple courts. And may have, uh, he may not have went back on Wednesday. Okay. Only Thursday. There's some debate on that. You get in there and, and wrestle with the chronological uh, events. It's, it's really fun to do. It's a lot of fun to, to try to figure these things out. And we're still on the Passover week. And Jesus goes back to those temple courts. And he's going to have a conversation with these, these Pharisees. I mean, he's going to, it's like they're in the background, but they're listening. Okay. He's going to address the people and go, you know what? Check out these guys. Look what they look like. So because of time, we will not go through the entire chapter of Matthew 23. But look what he says here. He says in verse 25, get farther down the chapter. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Again, Jesus is pointing out these leaders' hypocrisy. Woe to you, your hypocrites, your blind guides, you Pharisees, you teachers of the law, you high priests. Man, he's just letting it out. I mean, he is. This is this is the harshest, harshest teachings that Jesus will ever give. 
and it's his last public statement to people. And this is what he's got to say. It ain't pretty. It's pretty strong. Verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. See, that's what I meant about the tree, okay? It looks like it's alive, right? But on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. But really, you're dead. And then Jesus curses the tree. Just wonder if there's not a connection here, okay, with all this happening and these events happening. Just, just a thought. So there Jesus is, and he's just telling it like it is. Remember, he knows he's going to die in a couple days. And he didn't hold back. He does not hold back at all. And these men hate him for it. These religious leaders of the law that held Bibles just like me and you. right? They didn't have the New Testament yet. They had the Old Testament. They want to take him out because of this. Verse 29, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You blind, you no, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had to live in the days of our forefathers when these prophets came, right, we would have not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. We wouldn't have done that. So you testify against yourselves, Jesus says, that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. Now, we're going to get, this is going to connect us a little bit to the book of Revelation. When we come to the Bible, the Bible talks about cup of wrath, okay? And this is that cup of wrath. Um, and when a cup is full for a nation, God will destroy it. And that's what he's telling Israel here. That's what he's telling Jerusalem. Your cup is full. And when your cup is full, there's this concept, and we'll see it in Revelation, that God's going to take you out. And their, their cup, their sin, it's filled this cup. And now judgment is going to come. So when it's full, you better look out. You better look out. Mm. Verse 33. You snakes. You brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men, and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue them from town to town. Now, God's already sent lots of prophets. But he's sending more. He's got apostles that he's going to send. He's got other New Testament prophets that he will send. And what are they going to do with them? They're going to crucify them. They're going to kill them. They're going to flog them. They will pursue them from one town to another. Do you remember Saul of Tarsus? That's exactly what he did. He wasn't satisfied with just staying in Jerusalem. He went out to other cities. He was a fanatic. He went as far as Damascus trying to get people and kill them. It had anything to do with the church. Then verse 35. And so upon you, will come all the righteous blood that has ever been shed on earth. It's coming on you, Jerusalem. You will pay for this, Jesus says. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Now, we know Abel's story, right? King killed Abel. But we do not know the story of Zechariah, son of Berechiah. We don't have that recorded. 
But we know it's a true story because Jesus said it. So he's given them a history lesson. And these people knew the history. And so he says in verse 36, I tell you the truth, all this will come upon what? This generation. Within a lifetime of these people, these things are going to happen. Now that's an important verse to remember right there. Very important. So there's Jesus, and he's just telling them. He's talking about those Pharisees. They're listening, but all the people are listening. Just the common people on the streets, they're listening to what Jesus is saying. And they know they're hypocrites. They've been watching these guys. That's why they, lo they love Jesus like they did, because he, he would just tell it like nobody else would tell it, right? Verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you weren't willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you'll not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's interesting. See, this is going to be Jesus' last public teachings. Those are the last words that we've got recorded. And he's going to walk out of that temple. That's it. You're not going to see me again. You're not going to get it till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's what they were saying when Jesus came into town. Now Jesus is about ready to die. See, they didn't really understand who Jesus was. And it's some of the same people that are standing here, right here when Jesus is talking to them, in just a couple of days are going to say crucify. And you know, isn't that what we did? Uh, there's there's a story over here connected to this Passover. If you would, this is extra. This one's for free, okay? It's over in the book of Exodus chapter 12, okay? In Exodus chapter 12, the first Passover, right? Moses is giving them instructions. And watch what it says, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people that are in there. Okay? Now, Watch what happens. When you get down to verse 5, the animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Choose your lamb on the 10th day of this month. And on this chart, that would have been Sunday. On this timeline, that would have been Sunday of this week. And didn't they choose the lamb? They did. Jesus, we're so glad to see you. We're so glad you're here. But on the 14th day, which will be Thursday, the Passover, the twilight, that's when they killed the lamb. See, the Israelites were to take that lamb and bring it into their home. And keep it for four days. Now you think about that. You're going to get personal with that lamb. You're going to fall in love with that lamb. Right? Uh, kids might be riding around the house. But then. On the 14th day. You're to kill that lamb. That lamb that you love so much. You're going to now kill. So that you can be delivered. These people chose the lamb. 
They chose Jesus. But then they changed their tune, didn't they? Just like all of us. Because see, we all put Jesus on the cross. We all killed that lamb because of our sins. We've all turned our backs on Jesus. All of us. The apostles are going to. The crowds are going to. Everybody is going to abandon Jesus. It's pretty sad, isn't it? Because we didn't get it. We didn't get it. But God is merciful. And that's why these lessons are here. And I hope, church, that we learn from these lessons. I hope that we get who Jesus is. Enough to change our lives and live for him. That brings us to chapter 24. So 23 is going to roll right into 24. Those are the last public words that Jesus gives to the crowds. And now Jesus left the temple. And was walking away when his disciples came to him and called his attention to the buildings. Look at these great buildings. Look at all these wonderful things, the lights. and I mean, it was just beautiful. Herod had put a lot of money into restoring the temple at this point. It was beautiful. Watch what Jesus says. Do, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left on another, everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So what do they do? They leave the temple. They go down to Kindron Valley. They come back up. They move up towards the top of the hill. They get on top of this hill. And while they're sitting there, maybe they're resting after coming up this hill. Jesus sits and he has a conversation with his apostles. He tells them, uh, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be, I'm getting rid of my picture here, the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? What will be the sign, right? When will this happen? And that is the rest of Matthew 24. So, Next week, we are going to see that when the Romans came in, they did not leave one stone upon the other. And these are the actual stones from the temple. Many of them are still buried underground, but the other ones are left. Those walls were torn down. The temple was torn down. And not one stone was left on another. And the question is, when is this pointing to? And when did this take place? And why did it take place? And we'll talk about that next week. Well, I hope you've been blessed. Hope you've learned some things. Again, I don't have all the answers. And I may be off on a few of the how to the days and how to put it all perfectly together chronologically. It is difficult. It's a difficult task. But I hope I've painted a good picture for you. To lead you up to what Jesus was trying to tell these people. And the bottom line is this. You don't really know who I am. And you don't really know why I'm here. You just don't get it. But you will. You will. We'll see you next time. And God bless you.